Hey everyone, today we're going to be talking about how to graph and recognize trig functions. So in our discussion of the unit circle, we talked about how to evaluate trig functions at common angles of the unit circle. But suppose we sort of graduate from these common angles and look at a broader scope. Suppose that I start at pi over 4, and then I rotate around the entire circle and land at the same spot. Well, 2 pi radians is the same as 360 degrees, so to speak. So if I want to do this, I can add 2 pi to pi over 4, and they get a result of 9 pi over 4. So I'm looking at a full rotation from this stopping point. But I see that the corresponding point, root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2, is where I land. And what this tells me about my trig functions is that if I evaluate sine and cosine at 9 pi over 4, I still get root 2 over 2 as an answer for both of them. So the takeaway from this is that if I have an angle that keeps traveling around the unit circle, my trig functions are going to start returning repeated values, as they did in this example. Now suppose that I'm looking at a negative angle. Consider negative pi over 3. What I can actually do is realize this as a positive angle. I'm going to subtract pi over 3 from 2 pi and get 5 pi over 3 radians. Visually, we see that these give us the exact same location on the unit circle, and then when we compute cosine and sine of these different values, negative pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3, we see that we get the exact same values for both. This intuition actually helps us understand the graph of cosine as a function. So let y equal cosine of x, and it turns out the graph has this appearance. It is going to stretch as tall as 1, go down as low as negative 1, and left and right is just going to go on forever. Cosine of x has infinitely many x-intercepts and infinitely many points where it achieves both positive and negative 1. Some popular points to put on the graph would be plus minus pi over 2, plus minus pi, plus minus 3 pi over 2, and so on. So yeah, as a function, y equals cosine of x looks like this. y equals to sine of x has a very similar appearance. It stretches as tall as positive 1, it goes down as far as negative 1, and expands left and right infinitely. So what we talked about at the top of the slide was that cosine and sine repeat a lot of values. And the graphs definitely show that. Since they zigzag, you see that a lot of the same y values are being repeated, even though they're being evaluated at different x values. Functions that behave like this are called periodic, and we'll talk about that more in the next slide. Some basic properties of these functions is that they both have the same domain and range. The domain for sine and cosine of x is all real numbers, and the range is negative 1 to positive 1, including. I'm going to zoom in on this particular slice of the cosine function. I use the word periodic, which essentially means that I have an infinite repetition of the same shape. The curve that I've drawn here is the shape that's repeated infinitely many times in the cosine function. When looking at periodic functions, a way to classify them is to pay attention to the shape that's being repeated and look at how much of the x-axis is being covered by that shape. So the line that I've drawn here goes from negative pi over 2 to 3 pi over 2, and this has a length of 2 pi. In this case, we would say that y equals cosine x has period equal to 2 pi. If we study y equals sine of x in the same way, we see that exact same shape, but it sits in a different spot in the x-axis. Even still, we realize that from 0 to 2 pi is where that shape is repeated. Therefore, y equals sine of x also has period equal to 2 pi. In the next few slides, we'll look at graphs for more trig functions. The next graph that we're going to look at is the graph of the tangent function. The first thing we'll do is we'll evaluate tangent at a few values, theta equaling to 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. When we write down the corresponding xy points and the value of tangent at each of these thetas, we get points that are 0, and we also get points that are undefined. I'll go ahead and start recording some of this information on the xy plane. I'm going to draw a dotted line to represent vertical asymptotes, because everywhere my function is undefined, I have a vertical asymptote in this case. And I'm going to record my x-intercepts, in other words, where tangent of theta is equal to 0. It turns out that the graph of y equals the tangent of x looks like this. It's going to be an increasing graph, and it's going to have a period equal to pi. The domain of this function is going to be all values of x that are not some odd number times pi over 2. 
In our chart that we've drawn, we see that the values that we're undefined at are pi over 2, which is equal to 1 times pi over 2, and 3 pi over 2. Both of those are instances of pi over 2 multiplied by an odd number, and those are going to represent all of our vertical asymptotes. Notice also that the tangent function does have a y-intercept at the point 0, 0. And if I plug in the point pi over 4, I get a value of 1, and that tells us that this periodic function is always increasing. Notice how with the sine and cosine functions, one of them crossed the origin and one of them crossed the y-axis at the point equal to 1. And that was sort of how you distinguish between the two. The tangent and cotangent function, which we're about to draw on the next slide, will have a similar effect. We'll look at whether or not it has a y-intercept and if it's increasing or decreasing. We'll start off with the cotangent function in the same way. We'll draw this chart and evaluate cotangent at these same values theta, 0, pi over 2, pi, 3 pi over 2, and 2 pi. These corresponding x and y values are written as so, and then when we evaluate cotangent of theta, which is equal to the x-coordinate divided by the y-coordinate, we get three results of undefined and two results of 0, or at least in this chart. I am glossing over the computation details here, but all computations are being done solely by use of the unit circle. I'll go ahead and record my xy plane with my vertical asymptotes, in other words my points where I'm undefined, and my x-intercepts. And it turns out my cotangent function looks like this. It looks almost exactly like the tangent function, except I do not cross the y-axis, and I am decreasing instead of increasing. I also see that I have a domain, vol x, such that x is not equal to some integer multiple of pi, and that this function has a range from negative infinity to infinity. In other words, it goes up and down forever. And just like tangent, this function has a period of pi. Next, we'll talk about the graph of the secant function. Just like we've been doing, we'll evaluate the secant function at these theta values, where secant is equal to 1 over the x-coordinate. And we find that at 0, pi, and 2, pi, we equal 1, negative 1, and 1. And then at pi over 2 and 3, pi over 2, we're undefined. The secant function is still defined as 1 over the cosine function. So I'll draw the cosine function here just as a reference. I'll also encode the plane here with our vertical asymptotes and our points where we equal 1 or negative 1. And it turns out that y equals the secant of x looks like this. So it looks like y equals the secant of x is more or less trying to avoid cosine of x, except at these points where cosine of x and secant of x are both equal to either 1 or negative 1. Notice that every time that cosine of x is crossing the x-axis, we have a vertical asymptote for y equals to secant of x. And this makes sense, because if secant is equal to 1 over cosine of x, and cosine of x is allowed to equal 0, 1 over 0 is undefined, so secant of x must avoid those values. I'll go ahead and erase the cosine function so this is a little bit easier to look at and chart down some information. The domain of this function is all real numbers x, except x values that equal some odd number times pi over 2. And the range is going to be negative infinity to negative 1 union with 1 to positive infinity. We can see that this function is also periodic and is going to have a period equal to 2 pi. And we also have a y-intercept at the point 0, 1. Drawing the graph for y equals to cosecant of x is incredibly similar to what we've just done. Just like before, I'm going to draw sine of x as a reference, and I'm going to encode the xy axis with the points at which I'm undefined. Here, for a cosecant of x, I'm undefined at the point 0, pi, and 2 pi, at least on this chart. Evaluated at pi over 2, I get 1, and cosecant evaluated at 3 pi over 2 gives me negative 1. And it turns out that my graph for the cosecant function looks like this. Cosecant is defined as 1 over sine, so just like before, it looks like this particular graph is trying to avoid the sine graph, except for the parts where they're intersecting. And we also have vertical asymptotes at the points where our sine function is equal to 0. I'll go ahead and erase the sine function so this is a little bit easier to look at and start recording some information. The domain of cosecant of x is equal to all real numbers of x, such that x is not equal to some integer times pi.
and the range is going to be equal to negative infinity to negative 1 union with 1 to infinity. Now this graph looks incredibly similar to the secant graph, but the big distinguisher here is that the cosecant function graph does not have a y-intercept. We'll go ahead and wrap up this video with some quick examples. First, let's ask, is pi over 2 in the domain of the function cosecant x plus 1? The first thing to realize is that the plus 1 happening outside the trink function actually doesn't affect the domain at all. The only thing it would affect is the range, but we're not asking about that. Let's go ahead and write down the domain of y equals the cosine of x. It's equal to the set of all real numbers, x, such that x is not equal to some integer multiple of pi. But here, pi over 2 is not equal to some integer multiple of pi. Therefore, pi over 2 is in the domain of cosecant of x. Like we just saw on the previous slide, cosecant of pi over 2 is actually equal to 1, and the unit circle can verify this. So now let's ask if pi over 2 is in the domain of a slightly different function, the function g of x equal to cosecant of 2 times x plus 1. Again, the plus 1 on the outside still does not affect the domain. But let's evaluate g at pi over 2 and see what happens. Evaluating this function, we see that g of pi over 2 is equal to cosecant of 2 times pi over 2 plus 1, which simplifies down to cosecant of pi plus 1. However, we know that pi itself is not in the domain of cosecant. So this tells us that pi over 2 cannot be in the domain of g of x. Therefore, we're done.